This podcast may contain forward-looking statements that are subject to risks and uncertainties. These forward-looking statements are based on current expectations and may differ materially from actual future events or results due to a variety of factors. For a discussion of factors that could affect our business, please refer to our filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. All of our statements are made as of today based on information currently available to us. We can give no assurance these statements will prove to be correct, and we do not intend and undertake no duty to update these statements except as required by law. Welcome to the Inovix Journey to Scale podcast for Tuesday, January 23rd, 2024. I'm Kristen Atkins, Vice President of Marketing and Communications. In this episode, we're joined by Dr. Rob Rosen, Senior Strategic Materials Director at Inovix, to discuss the company's recent announcement with Group 14 and to better understand the company's material strategy. Welcome and Happy New Year. How are you today? I'm doing great, Kristen. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful to talk to you. Before we jump into the topic today, Give us a little bit more about your background and your role at Inovix. I joined Inovix back in 2014. Um, I've been doing this kind of work mostly, not not batteries really, but uh, research primarily um, all the way since back around uh, 1990. So I've been in this field for quite some time. I started out at Dow Chemical. I'm actually an organometallic chemist by training. Um, And I did uh, polyolefin catalysis there and moved on to a high throughput R&D company called Simix Technologies. And I spent uh, 13 years at Dow and about 11 years at Simix. And I finally came to Inovix to do something completely different with batteries in 2014. Um, My current role is Senior Director of Strategic Materials. That means that it's it's, it's an interesting move for me to this position. Um, I've been, as I said, kind of an R&D for almost my entire career in one way or another. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is definitely different. It's in the procurement organization. And my job is to interface with world-class companies that are out there making new materials um, and developing new technologies for lithium-ion batteries to make sure that we have access to and are utilizing best-in-class materials, cutting-edge materials, things like that. And it's a really fun role. It's, It's something I didn't realize I would enjoy doing, but I'm really, I'm really loving it so far. So from a material standpoint, talk to us about what makes Inovix unique. We've developed our architecture around the idea of stacking our electrodes, positioning our electrodes orthogonally to the way everyone else does it. And what that does is it allows us to concentrate the forces of the expansion onto a smaller face of the cell than a conventional cell. And that allows us to address the forces that arise as the silicon expands um, using our unique constraint systems. So those are kind of the key things about the architecture that are unique to us. There's other more subtle things that we do inside our cell um, to be able to use silicon, but that's really the, the driving part of the architecture that makes us stand out. And so what can our battery architecture do that others can't? The the key thing is our ability to use 100% silicon as the active material in our cells um, at high energy densities with with very high loadings of those materials Mm -hmm. uh, and get cells that that achieve the kind of cycle life and other performance characteristics that are required by by the battery industry. And so it's 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 a unique position that we have there. um, With with that capability. Let's dive in then. Uh, We we have this architecture that enables us to use 100% active silicon. What is active silicon? Right. So that means that the the anode material, the material that is taking up lithium when you're charging the battery and releasing lithium when you're discharging the battery, um, is entirely silicon in our system. And that's what we strive for. Um, The common anode material in most lithium ion batteries is graphite. Graphite is a form of carbon in which it's layered and the lithium is taken up by intercalating itself between the layers. And silicon um, is capable of holding a tremendous amount more lithium than, than graphite can. And that's the appeal of silicon. But the challenge is that when you lithiate it, it expands very much. So when we say 100% active silicon, we mean it is the only 
material to hold the lithium in our cell. Okay, so we use 100% active silicon or silicon oxide. It's not silicon oxide like people think of as SiO2. It, that would be that would be sand and that's not the material. This is a material that is silicon with some level of oxygen in it that is significantly lower than two oxygens per silicon. And it's a pretty common material in the battery field. Have we tested pure silicon? We have. So what people refer to as metallurgical grade silicon, just pure silicon, um, is a really intriguing material. And it's tremendously attractive because there's an expectation that it could be quite inexpensive and it's very readily available. Mm -hmm. um, we have worked on it and we continue to work on it, but it's a long-term research program to achieve that. And it's very challenging. Mm -hmm. Um, there are significant problems achieving commercially relevant cycle lives with metallurgical grade silicon. And to try to simplify why that is, um, and we have battery scientists in the company, anode scientists, who are much better than me at explaining this, but I'll give it a shot. Um, silicon particles in the expansion and contraction process tend to fracture. Mm -hmm. And... One of the things that's important to a lithium ion battery is this formation of something that that a lot of people have probably heard of called the SEI yes. layer. That's the when, solid when, electrolyte interface. Correct. Yes. As the particles expand and contract, and especially if they fracture, that SEI layer can get destroyed. It certainly does when the particles fracture. And then you need to reform the SEI, which is done by using materials that are additives in the electrolyte. Mm -hmm. And that consumes those additives over time, and that really impacts cycle life. Um, there have been a lot of work at universities and other places and startups and things to try to solve these problems. And the solution is to go to extremely small silicon nanoparticles. But there are a number of issues associated with putting those into a viable battery um, and the materials start to get significantly more expensive. So the various engineered silicon materials that are being developed are to way are are intended to give you a way to have these really small silicon grains that are contained within some sort of a framework um, that can hold them and protect them during cycling. And the most common framework is carbon. Well, that's a good segue then. To explain that a little further, that is a good segue into our into our announcement with Group 14. Right. Um, I, I think when we when we made this announcement and having talked to some some people who follow Anovix and and friends and people who ask me questions, they see that the Group 14 material is one of these engineered silicons that people call a, a silicon carbon composite, mm -hmm. and there's a tendency to want to think of that carbon as being like a graphite anode material and that we're no longer using 100% active silicon. That's not true. Mm -hmm. The carbon, carbon comes in many different forms and graphite is one of them. And the form of the carbon in these silicon carbon composites is not an active anode material. And so we're not putting graphite into our cell. We're not changing the fact that we're 100% silicon. Now, Purists or, or people who want to really nitpick there will say, well, some of the carbon probably interacts with lithium. Yes, that's probably true. There is some amount of active in the car of activity in the carbon, but that's not the intent of the carbon. The carbon is intended to form a framework to contain the silicon. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of companies working on these types of materials. Um, group 14 is one of them. Mm -hmm. They are very innovative. They're a tremendous team to work with and group to work with. And we're really impressed with where they've come in their material. And we're really excited about moving forward and, and using their material in our cells. Mm -hmm. In the press release that we issued about a week ago about working with Group 14, um, Anovix said that their material works well within our architecture. So what are you seeing? It, we're seeing everything we would have expected from an advanced material like this. It gives us uh, very, very high energy densities and really good cycle life. Um, and we're able to control the expansion very nicely. Um, part of that comes from their engineered particle that helps, and part of it comes from our architecture. And the combination of those two lets us pack a tremendous amount of their material into our cell to really achieve some uh, really interesting performance capabilities within our Anovix architecture. 
So it's a pretty exciting combination of materials. Are you working with other vendors beyond Group 14? We are. Um, at Inovix, we like to say that we are material agnostic in our cell. And, and what we mean by that is we have this unique architecture that we've developed and we have the high volume manufacturing techniques that we've been developing to build our unique cell. And so there's a tremendous amount of innovation around that. And it allows us to use all sorts of different cutting edge materials in our cells. And that is really exciting for nerdy battery scientists mm -hmm. like me and the other people here that you can do that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, we can work with different cathode materials. We can work with all sorts of different anode materials. And we are doing so. Mm -hmm. um, there's a tremendous amount of innovation going on in this space right now. All sorts of fascinating startups developing new silicon anode materials, bigger companies working in the field. And there are a lot of materials out there right now. And we really enjoy testing them. And we keep an open mind about finding materials that will perform incredibly well in our cell and give us um, performance advantages in energy and things like that uh, so that we always have a compelling cutting edge product that we hope will be ahead of our competition. So, mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a very exciting time to be in the battery field with the developments that are going on with things like that. And Novix architecture can work with all different types of materials. And yeah. based on our customer requirements and the best performing materials and cost, we'll decide which material we ultimately use in a given product. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We we will base our decisions on materials and and what we develop on customer specific requirements, you know, our own internal testing of, of what gives us performance advantages, all sorts of factors like that. But we can absolutely tune the cell with different materials um, quite easily. And uh, we're enjoying that. And, and like I said, there's the innovation in the silicon field. I'm constantly fascinated by what's going on there. How are you making sure that Anovix will have enough supply? Well, that that's why we do things like um, what we're doing with Group 14. What you want to do there is uh, you want to be working with these uh, suppliers early, um, discuss what kind of expectations we're going to have about materials need going forward and look to enter into supply agreements that guarantee that we have access uh, to the materials we need in the quantities we need and at a competitive cost that that we uh, you know find acceptable to use in ourselves. So that's what we're trying to do is uh, form these tight relationships with some of these advanced materials companies to get access. So you've talked a lot about the anode and all the innovation going on there. What about cathode? We are definitely actively working with cathode as well. It's something that I've been really involved in and, and actually have had a lot of fun doing. Um, because of our targeted effort in consumer electronics right now, our effort in cathode is really focused on LCO materials, lithium cobalt oxide. Those are the higher voltage cathode materials that are typically used in your cell phone and other devices. Mm -hmm. Um, we are working with the leading LCO companies in the world. We are using cutting edge materials right now that in many cases are developmental and not even fully at the manufacturing scale yet to make sure we're testing things, you know, in advance of when they're even uh, out there so that we are ahead of the game. And, uh, and we've, the LCOs we're using now are, are really, really fascinating and and giving us very uh, nice leaps in performance in our cells. What about um, electrolytes? Any innovation happening there? Similar. Um, we work with all sorts of companies. Um, we have a very talented internal team of electrolyte scientists that develop that uh, that help direct the work and the research. Um, electrolytes are another really interesting field for a chemist like me because they consist of multiple components that do all sorts of things and. Uh, give you different performance results in your cell. You you have things in there to help with cycle life and gassing and all sorts of different uh, parts of the battery. And it's really a complex field. There are a lot of companies innovating in that area too. So we're working with both the world-class largest electrolyte suppliers in the world, um, which really gives us confidence in their track records and their ability to deliver for a plant like ours in Penang, mm -hmm. but also smaller startups that are developing unique additives and innovating in the area. So we have access to new materials. So we're 
we're really working uh, with quite a variety of companies in that area too. I'm going to shift gears a little bit and let's talk about the Route Jade acquisition um, that brought coding in house. What are what are those advantages and how does that help you? I think all of us at Inovix are thrilled with the Route Jade acquisition. There's a there's a wealth of talent and knowledge there that's a thrill to have. First of all, you know they make batteries and have customers for batteries, and so the fact that they do that and really know what it takes to get things to market and stuff, you know, for a company that's that's younger, like like the Inovix part of us, um, I think that's a really exciting thing to have uh, in-house and to have their knowledge and experience in the field. Um, specifically on coding, coding has always been a real bottleneck for us. Mm -hmm. um, it, it slows down our research. You know, when you take these anode or cathode materials, you have to make formulations of them with the other ingredients that are used, for lack of a better word, the other components, mm -hmm. and you slurry coat them onto these foils and, and use them to build your cells. And that has really slowed our research. Being able to do enough variation in that field is something we just haven't had the capability to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so having it in-house now allows us to really accelerate our R&D, look at new materials and electrode compositions much more rapidly and test them in full cells, which lets us uh, develop improved technology, specific cells for customer needs and customer requirements, things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's a really exciting development. It will really be a game changer for Novix in terms of our speed of research, in my opinion. Excellent. So when you think about uh, the materials landscape and you look out five, 10 years, what are, what, what are you most excited about? Um, wow. <laughs> I think particularly in anode materials is, uh, to me, is really, really exciting. Looking what is done to push it more. And of course, as we've already talked about, the idea of really achieving the promise that like metallurgical silicon gives and how much capacity just pure silicon could give mm -hmm. people solving those problems. That's really exciting because it really will make batteries just leap forward. The cathode material work is really, really fascinating as well. There's all sorts of new materials being looked at, um, you know, because of the expense and the elements that are used in some of these cathode materials, finding less expensive, innovative cathode materials for cells uh, is, is really fascinating. So I just love the fact that this field with the drive to electrification of the world mm -hmm. and... Um, and, and, you know, in terms of energy storage, as well as vehicles and electronics, is there's just so much in this field and there's going to be so much innovation in the next 10 years. And I can't wait to see what happens. I can't wait to see, you know, what cars are out there available to buy in five years. And I can't wait to see, you know, how well we can store energy in our homes and things like that. It's just, it is a really cool time to be in the battery field. It is. Me too. Well, thank you so much for walking through the company's material strategy. It is always a pleasure to talk to you, Dr. Rob Rosen. Thank you, Kristen. That concludes this episode of our Journey to Scale podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe for alerts. We'll be releasing new episodes as we reach new milestones and scale up to high volume manufacturing. Until then, thank you and have a great day.